Well, we're ready to start, and uh, again, it's a, a pleasure to be with you guys and to fellowship, to fellowship in the Word, and not just the, the Scriptures, the Word, but to fellowship in the Word of His heart, um, and to draw closer to His heart, not just draw closer to God, a God, but to draw closer to His heart. Um, and to know Him on a more intimate basis as much as we can every day, every week, however often we make that move. Um, well, the title for what I want to share uh, today is No Longer a People of the Boat. No Longer a People of the Boat. Um, and uh, I do have an alternate title, uh, and that is um, God's Intervention. Or another alternate title is, God is giving us an intervention. But we're going to go with uh, no longer a people of the boat. Well, it's the story of Jesus walking on the water. And I love this story and I refer to it a lot. And, um, but I think the Lord's given me some new, fresh things for you. And I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 14 uh, for this particular um, uh, gospel and its view. Matthew 14, beginning with verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to, to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the, the wind ceased. Then they were in the ship, they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. All right. So they're in a storm. All right. They're in, they're in a bad situation. They're in a storm. And Jesus is coming to them. Jesus is coming to them. In the storm. Look, Jesus is coming to us in the storm. And, um, you know, yay! <laughs> Jesus is coming through us in the storm. Um, <clears throat> but then he stops before he gets to them. And he's kind of off a bit. And he stops and he stands at a distance. And then when Peter says what he says, he says, you come. Instead of me coming to you, you come to me. Well, this is, this is all I need to share, really. <laughs> This is, this is good enough. This should last us for a month. But I'm going to go on. Um, and um, so, you know, he, Jesus could have come to them in the boat. He could have done that easily. He could have come to them in the boat and said, Oh, Peter, you, you, want, to, you want to come to me or you want to walk on water? And taken his hand and just, you know, walked him around on the water. And they've been together and stuff like that. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. And I want you to consider, and you don't have to turn there, but the reference is in Hebrews uh, 8, 8. And we'll read a couple of verses after that. Consider that in light of what I just said. Jesus could have come to them in the boat and taken them all by the hand and walked them around. <clears throat> so this is from Hebrews. For finding fault with them, talking about the, the first covenant, 
He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Jesus, because they continued not in my covenant. Okay, now, you know, that right there goes perfectly along with what I've been sharing about Jesus as the firstborn and calling his firstborn son out of us. Uh, that they didn't remain in his covenant even coming out of Egypt. That's what it says. And he had to come to them and take them by the hand and lead them. And he's saying that's not what he wants to do. Okay, uh, To lead them out of Egypt. See, this is, a, this is immediately just trying to get them out of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And this is a people called the firstborn. This is not my, my goal to teach this right now, but I you know, can't help but see it everywhere. <clears throat> all right. Um, so the Lord doesn't wish to do all of this for us uh, because if he does that, there's no, there's no challenge, there's no desire, there's no pursuit. It's just passivity and him doing everything. Well, help me, Jesus, get me out of this. Um, so I wrote, instead of holding our hand, he would rather we venture out in our crisis and keep our eyes on him. Okay, he would rather, because he, he could have just gone to the boat or he could have just immediately said, stop this storm, because he did it one other time. But that's not what he's trying to do. He's trying, uh, he's trying to get us to venture out of our crisis, even though we don't leave it, we're out of our crisis and we keep our eyes on him. We're coming to him and we're with him. And the storm is an anti-factor. It is not. It is not a factor because we've learned this crisis. I can still come to Jesus in it. And uh, so I wrote, Jesus wants us to use it as an opportunity to come be with him. He wants it. He wants the crisis as an opportunity to come be with him instead of what we always ask for, which is what? Deliverance. Lord, save me from Egypt. Lord, get me out of this crisis. That, that sort of thing. All right. So reading uh, back in Matthew 14, uh, looking at verse 27 again, 28. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. <clears throat> you know, we always say, well, we're all in the same boat. Well, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not all in the same boat. <laughs> um, Peter's not in that boat. He's going to Jesus. He's heading to Jesus. Um, so there is this, there is this scariness, um, we, you know, of being in a boat during the storm. And I wrote, but it is more scary putting yourself deeper into the crisis by getting out of the boat. I mean, when you're sitting in the boat, you're holding on, you're going, this is scary and Lord save me. But how scary is it to step out of that boat, go into the storm and find Jesus? Yes. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, but at some juncture, you, you have to decide how you will live your life in relationship to the Lord and in, according to Him. Will you live it in the boat? The title of this was no longer a people of the boat. Will you live it with Jesus always coming to you to intervene? Or will you live it by risking everything just to be with Jesus? See, we say, well, I do that all the time, but only when things are calm and good. Then I'll risk everything. But that's not when he can prove or you can prove where you're at with him. Uh, verse 26 says this, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They were troubled, saying, 
it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Ah! For fear. Ah! Man, fear. Our fears always want God to intervene. That's, that's us. But then run from Him when He sits down and wants to have an intervention. Remember my alternate title? God wants to have an intervention with us. We do not like to be confronted with our fears and with our self-centeredness and all the other things that always, we're always looking for. We're looking for, the, for a way out so that we can self-protect. And Peter was looking for a way to Jesus. And he was. I mean, human nature uh, and a storm, a big storm like that, makes you fear. But Peter wanted to come to Jesus. So I have a little subtitle called Finding Our Security in the Boat. The storm is nothing for Jesus. It is the same as in the calm. With Jesus out there and us in the boat, though, uh, uh, though it's not ideal, the boat seems to be the safest place at the time because we're a people of the boat instead of a people of, of coming to Jesus no matter what. Uh, we crouch inside our safety net waiting on Jesus to calm the storm but he desires to be more than a storm fixer to you. He wants you to fix. Not the storm, your eyes on him. <laughs> not, not on the storm, but your eyes on him, whereby he becomes your peace, your rest, your comfort in the storm. And your security is not in the boat. Praise God. That's good news. Now, it sounds great in the sermon, I know. But we're talking about in a real crisis, finding your security, not in whatever the boat is, the, whatever the object is, whatever the thing is that you can run to to find security. But to not run, but to walk to Jesus. <clears throat> All right, so uh, there is a cost. But the question is, how much do we want to come to him and at what cost? At the cost of our lives? The truth is that anyone who comes to Jesus does so at the cost of their life. Well, the cross makes that plain. Um, anyone who will come to Jesus when what they are told is that you can gain beautiful things from him, anybody can do that. Even, even Satan said, Job will love you and bless you as long as you're blessing him and taking care of him. Um, so, what is the basis for our loving Jesus? Do we love Jesus because he keeps us safe, because he's our protector, or do we love Jesus for him? Do we love, do we want to be with him, not with our fears? That's a big deal. That's, I know this sounds, you know, outside of a big crisis. If any of you are in a big crisis, then you're going, hmm, praise God, or whoa. But if you're not, it's just like, oh, this is a good sermon. But every one of us face crises at times. So uh, Matthew 14, 29 says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on. When Peter was come down out of the ship, Peter took a chance. Peter, he looks from the boat and he not only sees Jesus, but he sees a raging storm all about high billows, maybe mist over Jesus where you can barely make out his, his uh, person. Uh, in other words, not having a clear view. How do you get a clearer view in the storm? You get closer. <laughs> you get closer to Jesus. He's there, but it's like trying to gain honey from the rock. Praise God. So Habakkuk says there was a hiding, where there was the hiding of his power. And he was complaining because God wasn't doing anything. Well, God doesn't hide his power to make his complaint so that he doesn't do anything. God hides his power so that, I think I say it down here somewhere else, while, while we think the important thing was Jesus reaching out his hands to Peter, Jesus thinks the important thing was Peter's feet getting out of the boat and coming to him. That's the cool part. 
We've got to see these things from Jesus' point of view. We have to have his mind. We have to be bone of his bone. We have to be one with him so that we can see things in that light. <clears throat> so, um, uh, just another scripture. This one's in Mark, but it's the same story. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. Jesus makes it look like he's not going to help you. He's, there is the hiding of his power at times because he's trying to draw, draw. You know, we say uh, the scripture in Song of Solomon says, draw us, we will run. So we go, draw me, Lord, and I will run. He's trying to draw stuff out of you towards him, not just draw you to so, so you can get close and walk with him or something. He lets you feel as if should your faith fail, then all is going to be lost. He lets you feel that way. If you're that, you know, if I fail, everything is going to be lost. This is important. God's working. God, this is not the devil. <laughs> um, there is danger. He does not show himself with outstretched arms like a father to a baby. Come on, Peter. He doesn't do that. He's just standing there going, you want to come to me? then you come to me. Remember, he could have come all the way to the boat, but he stopped at a certain juncture. So uh, I wrote, the, but the fears are there only because we're considering actually coming to him. Peter's fears were different, and I'll mention that in just a minute. He was going through a different kind of fear than everyone else. And they were only there because he decided he wanted to come to Jesus in spite of the, the, the problem instead of getting Jesus come to him and fix the storm. Um, the disciples who choose to stay in the boat will not experience these fears. So praise God. So you get out of some stuff here. Um, so I wrote that they have their own boat fears. They have their own boat fears, but Peter has a set of fears called don't do it fears. <laughs> because you're contemplating. This is before you get out of the boat. Don't do it. What did I write down here? Surely no one walks on water and survives. Don't do it. Uh, the odds that I will sink and die of drowning are sky high. Don't do it. Who in their right mind would press in to the storm instead of seek to avoid it? Don't do it. Peter had all of that, just like we do. We are faced with this, and we say, well, um, this, it's just common sense. You're not supposed to go by common sense. You're supposed to go by the mind of Christ. So, I, well, this is, here's, here's sort of getting toward the summary now. You must come to him because you want him at any cost. Not because there are safeguards in place. I know, I know. The Lord knows, the Lord knows. He knows our frame. But we can overcome our frame by our love for Jesus. We can, we can. We have to, we're like a scale. We have to put more stuff on in love with Jesus and wanting Him and desiring Him so that the scales tip. That's what it's going to take. But we keep all this stuff over here and then we add to it when the crisis comes and then we end up going with common sense. <clears throat> why, why do we do that? Because that is not the issue with Him, though it may be with us. The issue with Him is... Um, not just us trusting in miracles or trusting in His hand. The issue with Him is get to a place where you're no longer a people of the boat, clutching, crouching, shivering. Get up and walk through the storm to Jesus. And if you'll do it, if you'll get out of the boat, you'll be with Jesus. You say, but I'll sink. You saw what happened. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. So, verse 32 says, And when they were come 
into the ship, the wind ceased. It was just a trial. It was just a test. As soon as he got in the boat, where's the storm? That's, it, was, it had purpose. These light afflictions work for us a far more eternal weight of glory while we look not at the storms that are seen, but the things which are not seen, which is Jesus and getting to him and seeing him and being changed and having his mind and his heart and, 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 and growing in that. And you, you, you grow, you, you don't grow in those kind of things in the, when everything's calm. You grow in that in the storm. That's just a fact. I'm going to read this scripture. This is out of Mark 8 and starting verse 11. <clears throat> and the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. They're looking for miracles just like the, the, the guys in the boat. And Jesus sighs deeply in his spirit and saith, why did this generation seek after a sign? Why do they always have to have proofs and protections and all of that? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them and entered into the ship again and departed to the other side. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's... This happened after they went through all of this when they were in the boat and they land and then the Pharisees come to him and start questioning, wanting miracles like the disciples were. And he said, there's no sign going to be given to you. And he goes and gets in the boat and goes to the other side. <laughs> so, Jesus is wanting you to learn to walk through the storms of life and just be with him. That's, that's the beginning. Because you are in Him. Because you are in Him, and that's not theology. It's not supposed to be theology. I mean, if Jesus is asleep in the boat and you're in Him, Jesus is not going to drown. God is not going to let His Son drown. But He will let, his, he will let that Son in you be uh, put into different circumstances so that He can come forth instead of us and our fears. He is your life. You are not your own, and that doesn't, you know, let's just forget I said that. He is your life. That's your life. That's my life. For you're dead, and your life is hid. You have to have it revealed. It's hid in Christ and God. But when he who is your life appears, then you appear with him, in him, of him, by him, to him. You are crucified to this world. Then it say that in, let's say, Galatians 6, 14, is that what it is? Crucified. Crucified to the world. Crucified to the storms. Crucified to, to all of the fears and feelings. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go through stuff. Like I said, Peter went through all kind of stuff, but he, in spite of his fears, he didn't wait for God to take the fears away, you know. Uh, it, you remember the story of uh, Elijah with his servant and they were in the city and the enemy came and surrounded the city and the servant said, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And everybody in the city was afraid. And what does Elisha do? Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes, his servant's eyes, not, not the enemy's eyes. Open his servant's eyes. And he saw char the chariots of God all around the whole city greater than the enemy. God's not wanting to show you, give you safeguards and show you that everything that makes you settle down and calm down. He's wanting him to be what makes you settle down and calm down. If you're in, again, if you're in Jesus, you, he's not going to drown. So, I just wrote in the last sentence, when will we become no longer a people of the boat. When? When? Well, how about right now? How about, let's see, let's get up and enter in. <laughs> that was last time. But you could play that one again right after this one. And then it would strengthen your faith to get up, go to Jesus in the storm, instead of yaying that he, look, it's Jesus coming to us in our storm. And then he stops and you go, don't stop. 
get over here. <laughs> no, he's saying, you stop what you're doing and come over here to me. You come be with me instead of me always having to fix your earth. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you are the Father of the Son in whom we live and move and have our being. Thank you that you do draw us, but you're drawing out of us that which is our heart and not our fears. You're not drawing our fears to the forefront or boiling us to, till, till our fears come to the top. You are in spite of the fears, and, and Peter probably, as, a, as I shared, probably had greater fears than they did because they had the boat. But he went against those fears, got out of the boat, and got into the storm worse than what was happening in the boat. And he started coming to you. And Jesus, your hands were there. But Lord, I thank you. I thank you for Peter's feet. I thank you that he slipped them over the boat, over the bo overboard. And he must have done it keeping his eyes on you because he didn't sink immediately. So as his feet went over the water, he wasn't looking at his feet. He was looking at his life. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for Jesus. We love you. We love you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Keep it up. Keep going. Amen.